Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online master of arts programs. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This event is part of the China series sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. This evening, we'll be hearing from Dr. Mir Sadat. Dr. Sadat has more than 25 years of experience in private industry and government. Dr. Sadat is a former policy director at the U.S. National Security Council, where he led interagency coordination on defense and space policy issues. In this role, he supported the establishment of both the U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command and reviewed national security decisions involving civil space and the U.S. commercial space sector. Dr. Sadat is also a Naval officer with intelligence and space qualifications, and in his preceding two Naval assignments, he served as a space policy strategist with Chief of Naval Operations and as a space operations officer with U.S. 10th Fleet. He has a PhD from Claremont Graduate University and has taught at various universities in California and Washington, D.C. Dr. Sadat, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm glad uh, these DC traffic didn't uh, prevent me from joining you. Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, so today uh, I want to talk about a couple of different topics, right? But they're all going to be sort of intertwined and related. Um, last five years, you have seen an increased uh, sort of shift uh, towards uh, what some people might call confrontation of China uh, and others have been, uh, you know, saying that we are not confronting China hard enough, um, but you are seeing some uh, sort of movements in the world kind of uh, holding China accountable. And this is a unique moment in time because uh, the last administration really pushed for uh, this sort of confrontation based on a set of principles. Um, and so when we talk about confronting China, we are not uh, saying we are confronting the people of China, we are not saying we are confronting Chinese culture or Chinese civilization. All of those three things are uh, um, are amazing things, right? The Chinese people are hardworking people. They're they're uh, innovative and they're smart, and uh, they travel the entire world and they are, you know are productive citizens of the world. We're not talking about Chinese culture. Chinese culture is amazing. Uh, every part of uh, the world you go to, you will find a Chinese enclave and they have their own culture and they promote it and the world benefits from it. And of course, we are not talking about the historical civilization aspect. This is not a war of civilizations against China. What we're talking about is the regime in China, right? So that's important to, to be able to talk about and how that regime plays along with other uh, members of the sort of world order, uh, whether they are big nations like Russia and the United States or smaller ones like Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and so forth. So this is something that we are we're talking about. And uh, the last administration named it uh, great power competition, a great power competition, meaning that these are great powers, Russia, China and the U.S., and they're competing uh, across a variety of domains. And uh, so when we say domains, we mean a specific uh, uh, sort of territory, a specific space that is very unique. So land, air, sea, cyber, and space would be the domains. And so we see a lot of competition uh, with these great powers, uh, strategic competition, this administration calls it, uh, strategic meaning that it goes all the way from economic, financial, to political and information, to military and intelligence, right? There's a competition in each of these domains and who will uh, be the dominant force in that domain and who will be uh, the, the supreme power in that uh, domain and who will uh, be victim. Uh, as you saw in the last uh, few months uh, with colonial uh, gas pipeline situation, uh, with solar winds, the cyber domain is an interesting one. We have, um, uh, not fully developed or understood that our capabilities yet and how we want to employ them and how the legal constructs help with that. Um, however, across all the domains, there is this competition, right? Uh, and of course, uh, President Obama's administration, uh, you know, touted something called the shift to the Pacific. And so that started back then. And 
in the last administration and in this administration, the focus has been on getting China to uh, start behaving like a responsible great power. And what does that mean? And so my focus specifically in the last few years has been with China and, and how that translates to the science and tech piece and also the, uh, the, the space industry and the sp uh, sort of space power aspects of the United States, right? Um, and so when we say that a nation is a space power, what we say is that that nation employs all of what we call the national instruments of power, which is diplomacy, information, military, economics, finance, and the legal uh, or the law enforcement aspect to uh, project their nation's power into a domain. So if you're a sea power, you do it into the sea. And if you're a uh, air power, it's into the air and space would be into space. So that that is what uh, we're talking about. And so in the last few years, we're talking about us losing that competitive edge, uh, potentially militarily, right? Uh, because of our, uh, you know, um, divided uh, attentions between counterinsurgency, terrorism, and of course, these big powers. And so we've spent a lot of our resources, our finite resources on uh, the you know, war on terror. Uh, and now we are focusing back on uh, great power competition. But in doing so, uh, America's arsenal of democracy has declined uh, because we have focused on sort of non-existential threats, right? Terrorism uh, does not destroy American uh, society or does not destroy America's government, right? But potentially a conflict with one of these great powers could, and it could, if not, at least sever, sever uh, the main nodes or nodules of uh, the U.S. government. And so some of the things that I've uh, been involved with, uh, with my colleagues and who have pushed as well, is that we need to compete with China across all of these domains. And so in the space domain, we compete uh, in a unique way uh, because the Chinese um, space program goes back to 1970 when they launched their first satellite, which is very relatively uh, young program. Uh, and of course, just last week or so, they talked about how they wanna put the first uh, human feet uh, on Mars, right? On the Martian planet. Uh, the, they are very ambitious. They are very uh, hardworking. They have unconventional means of obtaining uh, intellectual property. Sometimes they pay, sometimes they steal, right? Uh, and so the United States must compete with this uh, Chinese space power. And in doing so, uh, the United States needs um, an ambitious vision. Uh, it needs an, a vision uh, that can compare with the Chinese vision. The Chinese are very lucky in that they can project out 25 to 100 years into the future and say, this is where we'd like to be. The US, of course, we have a uh, election cycle and whoever is elected into power can uh, sort of set the tone. And, uh, and same thing with the oversight committees in Congress, they uh, do uh, some control there. And of course we have fiscal constraints, right? Uh, every September 30, the government runs out of money until uh, Congress uh, appropriates more money for it. So this are sort of some of the constraints we have. So a lot of us have called for a multi-administration, a multi-year, maybe even multi-decade U.S. space vision uh, so that every administration that comes along can feel like they are part of it, whether they're Republican or Democrat or other, because this is a U.S. vision. This is not a Republican vision or a Democrat vision. This is an American vision. And so in that sense, we are uh, a little bit uh, tied uh, to how we can maneuver. <clears throat> and so another area where we are uh, hampered is uh, the relationships that we have within our government are constrained in such a way where there's sort of no collusion between the government, right? Uh, so national security is bifurcated from civil space. And of course, the two are bifurcated from commercial and uh, within commercial, there are other aspects. But when you look at China, there is sort of a bleeding across of each. And of course, their uh, private industry is a quasi-private industry. Uh, a lot of them are front companies for their military or the intelligence services. So that's another area where when we compete, we don't compete fairly. And so, of course, uh, a lot of complaints about, uh, by our businessmen and women 
uh, in the space industry and in the tech industry saying, hey, the competition uh, for global um, customers, the competition in the supply chain is unfair, government help us. And the question is how and why should the government help us and, and what, are, what is the right mechanism to help so we don't disrupt and create another problem. And in all of that story, uh, China is uh, proclaiming, and you know, in the past, China would have said, we will do this by the year 2020, or we will do this by the year 2010. And they've kind of failed miserably, but in the last 10 years or so, they've been hitting the mark pretty well. So uh, just recently, China claimed that they wanna be the dominant space power by 2045. You know, so that's a space hegemon. And of course that should worry us, right? Because that means that we are then uh, not a dominant force. Uh, and whoever is a dominant force in a domain kind of dictates what happens, right? Um, and so the meteoric rise in the Chinese space program, their lofty ambition, their uh, idea that they are already starting to build what we call a critical infrastructure, right? Uh, to space uh, and, uh, you know, to uh, the cis lunar, which is the orbit around the moon. Uh, and of course, to beyond, they're building that um, um, uh, critical infrastructure is of concern for us because that means that China will be able to exert soft power uh, on other nations and coerce other nations or entice other nations to their uh, alliance. And this is very similar to the competition uh, that we saw during the Cold War between Russia and the United States, you know, the, the Warsaw Pact and, of course, the NATO uh, alliance. Uh, so something similar could potentially happen in space. And uh, those economic dependencies that China is establishing would uh, not just be in space, but it would trickle down and affect how they are uh, organized and interacting uh, on Earth, you know. And so that, that is an important uh, discussion that we have to see. On top of that, uh, this space race, uh, as you know, differentiated from the space race with Russia, that space race was about uh, symbolism, about you know, ideology, which system is better, uh, communism or capitalism, market capitalism. This one, while it has some of those uh, flavors to it, is really about economics. It's about the economics that can be derived from um, artifacts and assets in space, right, such as sort of the rare uh, minerals that are in, on, on the lunar surface, on asteroids, potentially if we can extract, uh, uh, you know, um, soil and artifacts from Mars. And of course, the uh, services and capabilities that uh, space assets provide us, right? Uh, you know, so uh, in 1996, when GPS became pub a public good, uh, you know, that uh, cost of a, a satellite phone went from, you know, $10 a minute to like a, a dollar a minute. And of course, it kept on even decreasing. Uh, now, uh, it's you pay a monthly plan that is cheaper than your hourly plan back then, right? Um, and so this is the discussion that we are having is this is an economic race. The By 2040, we are saying that the uh, space industry will be close to a trillion dollars. The Chinese are estimating that to be about uh, anywhere between five to 10 times as much uh, by 2040. Uh, and so this is the competition we are in right now in the new space race that is not just about which system is better, but it's about which nations, entrepreneurs and economies will benefit and whose peoples uh, will actually benefit. Now. As a member of the, the, the global uh, sort of world, we want all of humanity to benefit, right? That is unfortunately not the way the Chinese look at the world. They look at it as to Chinese benefit before everybody else. Uh, I would say, yes, the U.S. has an entrepreneurial mindset as well, but we have pretty much a, hey, let's make everybody rich in the process mindset, not that we want to hurt anybody else. And so the discussion then becomes, you know, what... Who and what if uh, the Chinese get to moon to the moon the first? What if they set up a base? Uh, according to existing statutes, you know we would have to allow uh, other nations free uh, through fare to those bases. What if they don't? What if they uh, drill uh, uh, and extract things from the moon, but then they uh, destroy parts of the moon? Who's liable for that? What if they make it so that other 
other nations cannot go and extract uh, things from the moon? What if there are collisions in, in space? Um, what if there's an SOS call? What if there is potentially hijacking or you know, um, cyber hacking of uh, assets in space? These are all discussions that are sort of now becoming uh, you know, um, uh, you know the, the, the discussion of the day. You, know, you might've heard about a couple of months ago or a year ago, but a senator talking about uh, pirates in space, you know, and everybody kind of chuckles. But you know, that that is actually a reality. What if there is some kind of a piracy? What if if it's not necessarily stealing of your goods? What if it's a stealing of your IP? Right? If I can see how your machine or your asset or your uh, mechanisms operate, and I can replicate that from myself, and and basically steal the schematics from you, what who who controls that? Right? Uh, what if there's a crime that occurs in space? Who is responsible for apprehending that person or persons on Earth? You know, uh, which U.S. Uh, agency or department or service is the lead for that? And so that's kind of the the big discussion, right? That we're involved in. Um, and uh, beginning of the year, uh, Bruce Cahan and I we wrote a uh, report that stemmed out of last summer's Defense Innovation Unit, uh, Air Force Research Lab, and the US Space Force uh, seminar on uh, the space industrial base. And so we came up with a vision that utilizes a whole of nation effort, uh, and also in that it's a unity of effort, right? Synchronizing across the entire government uh, to compete with China, right? Compete with them at all angles and also reforming our financial uh, commitments, how we commit those things, and also organizational reforms, right? Um, the United States uh, has to have some kind of a interagency uh, level for policy, uh, for space, for example. Right now, the Space Council that uh, was running before is still there. The Vice President, Vice President Kamala Harris said that she will be the chair of it, However, the positions that are sort of the, the main drivers, the executive secretary, hasn't been fulfilled yet. Uh, and I guess they are still interviewing in the process. Um, and so that is important. The U.S. space supply chain is important. Why? What if uh, uh, duds or uh, malicious parts come into our supply chain? Uh, what if we are depending critically on uh, parts on China? Right. We saw what happened with the COVID-19 face masks that were being de developed in China and them raiding Chinese factories that were producing masks for the U.S. and other nations. What if they do that with um, critical parts that we depend on? What if it's critical parts that can be uh, tampered with later on while it's in space? Uh, so those are important things that we have to consider. Do we want to uh, have our supply chain in vulnerable places, or do we want it in uh, sort of the nations and the countries that we are aligned with who think like us, right? They don't have to look like us, but they think like us. And why don't we diversify that supply chain with that uh, and potentially even move it to the Western hemisphere, right? Uh, we have problems with migration. Well, maybe some of those uh, can, can be uh, resolved with uh, a supply chain being relocated there. Um, counterintelligence issues and counter espionage, right? Counterintelligence uh, being, you know, other nations uh, penetrating your nation's systems and uh, uh, people and your, your, your classified materials, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, NASA, DOD or elsewhere. And of course, counter espionage, which is the IP theft of our nation's uh, industry, right? That's an important piece. And of course, on top of that, China graduates more people in STEM than all of the United States combined uh, in universities, right? So uh, they just spam the world with STEM graduates, right? Uh, smart people. But uh, the U.S. Is, is, has a shortage there. So if the U.S. is not going to uh, hire or create its own uh, STEM graduates to be incorporated into this S&T, uh, science and technology industry, whether it's AI, ML, whatever, or space, then we need foreign uh, talent. Where do, we get, where do we get that foreign talent from, right? Uh, and so that's an important discussion to have. And how do we grow that talent domestically, right? Uh, and of course, then it's uh, applying di diplomacy to level the playing field so that... Uh, 
the international markets are uh, equal uh, and, and open to all, open and fair trade, right? And of course, the other discussion is, um, you know, last year we declared our election system a critical infrastructure, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security has 16 critical infrastructures. Um, and uh, why is uh, our space assets and the information that we derive from that not declared a critical infrastructure? Because, uh, you know, one minute of uh, interruption into that would send uh, hospitals into turmoil, banking industry into turmoil. Um, I wouldn't be able to even get drive home from wherever in DC that I live. Uh, and so, you know, what does that mean? Uh, and of course, then we are looking at uh, something futuristic, right? Because the Chinese have already envisioned what they want to look like in 2050. Uh, where do we want to even be in 2030, let alone 2050 or 2060? So that, that is something that uh, we all uh, have to sort of discuss and debate and be open to debating, right? Um, and, 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 and not just worry about, uh, you know, keeping the machine going. And so when we talk about space, we talk about different orbits. We have LEO, where majority of economic commerce is happening in, right? That, that is where uh, the ISS station is at. Um, it takes on, on a very good day and a good year. It could take you anywhere between 9 to 12 minutes to get to LEO, and it could take you longer, right? And an ISS trip could be as short as 15 minutes if it's the right day and the right time and the right month of the year, or it could take you longer, up to days, right? Um, the moon, uh, the cislunar, uh, that area that would be called sort of the uh, ex-geo uh, ex, um, orbit um, is, you know, like literally three days away from here. Uh, it'll take you longer to get there if it's not the right conditions, but it's shorter. It's the same distance as a cal drive from here, Washington, D.C. to California, right? Think about it in that sense. So the, the moon has never been closer to the Earth uh, in that regard. Uh, the fact that in the next five to 10 years, you might see private space stations happening in Leo, you know, uh, Hilton, maybe with an infinity pool. Uh, it's going to be very expensive. Nobody probably listening on this uh, uh, call will probably be able to afford it. Hopefully you will. Uh, but that, that, those are discussions to be had, right? Uh, the, the trips into uh, outer space. And so that is the Leo is, is what's the, in front of us right now. That is the one that is very congested like, you know, those highways that we have at five o'clock when everybody gets off work. Uh, and you have to always be attentive to make sure you're not colliding uh, or in, in space, we call it conjun uh, conjun conjunctions. Um, but the next phase is really the cislunar, uh, the ex-geo orbit. And, uh, and, and further, we go into the solar system as we go into Mars. And so there needs to be an infrastructure built. And there are companies now that are discussing which part of that infrastructure they built, just like when Eisenhower built uh, our great highways, right? So that this is sort of where we're at in the, in the great uh, sort of competition with, uh, with China and Russia. Russia is still a competitor. Russia is really not a competitor when it comes to space technology. Russia is very much still a, a danger when it comes to missiles and nuclear warheads. Uh, and so forth. Uh, Russia is still a, a preeminent threat when it comes to cyber, cyber attacks of our systems in space. Um, but China is really the uh, peer, near peer or probably even near uh, competitor when it comes to space technology uh, in that uh, the Russians are very reckless in space, just like you've seen on video clips, how they buzz our ships uh, and the Baltic and other places in the Atlantic, they are just like that. And I think it was last year that General Raymond uh, talked about two of those instances where they were trolling us in space. And think about it this way, 17,000 miles an hour you're traveling, there's very little time to make adjustments. And if they're in the same plane as you are where you're tra traveling uh, and they're trolling you or they're trying to you know, harass you, this is, uh, could be catastrophic. And uh, the reason it could be catastrophic is, for example, when the Chinese uh, exploded or they, um, they attacked one of their weather satellites in 2007, uh, and this is in 2007, uh, the, the debris from that, the debris field from that, it will still be around until 2007. So it takes a long time, close to 25 or so years for debris in, in LEO orbit to burn to the ground. Uh, and a little speck as big as a dime can cause some uh, damage to a satellite. Those are soft tissue uh, equipment that you have in space. 
So this is the kind of discussion that we are having. Uh, the next phase, of course, is who controls sort of the highway to Mars and how do we get there, right? Uh, and, and that is very much so, I would say, still sort of a ideology, which system is better than ours type of competition, right? Whereas this other one in Leo is an economic competition. That is very much who's going to get there first. Is it the Chinese that will have their feet on the ground there? Or will it be U.S. and, and allied nations that will have their feet uh, on the ground there? Um, who will be the first Asian on the moon is a good discussion to have. The Chinese went there uh, and they planted their flag uh, with a robot, collected some soil and came back, but they still haven't foot, set foot on the moon. So by 2030 something, uh, you know, who uh, will the Japanese beat them? Will the Indians beat them? These are all discussions and these are all sort of part of that uh, neighborhood that they live, bragging rights that we have to think about. So <clears throat> I want to close it up and, and hopefully we can get some questions going. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, any questions open. But that's the, the competitive world we live in right now. Um, and we need to think about how we invest. And so, you know, the old space race was, uh, you know, the, the, the Sputnik shock. We've, we've heard of it. Uh, and, of course, we made a lot of investment. We made huge investments and dumped a lot of money, research and development and, and foundational science and technology research to help us uh, sort of beat the Russians to the moon. And, of course, that had amazing effects everywhere else, uh, affecting our military, affecting our systems, our economic way of life, and a lot of comforts that we had, right? Uh, a lot of equipment that we use at home are benef benefits that we derive from that competition. Uh, right now, we are investing less than a fourth of that type of GDP. Uh, and our GDP is much, much bigger, of course, than back then. Uh, so if we increased our GDP by like 1%, uh, that would have a, a seismic shift in how we invest, right? Um, that would have a huge, uh, would send a huge signal to our universities and colleges where students are enrolled to say, hey, if you study STEM, you know, uh, engineering or something, or even if it's a STEM related type of field, there's an, is, there's an industry where we can go and, and, and get employed and, and not have to worry about, uh, you know, job search because there's going to be always a job search, right? Um, so that's an important piece. So we have still the competitive edge. Uh, we may no longer be able to uh, uh, deter other nations in space if we lose that competitive edge. And so uh, inaction on our part, you know, just will increase uh, our, S our margins of error in assessing um, adversaries' uh, conduct and how they behave. Uh, and so we must employ uh, some really good ways of uh, investing in our future, you know. Uh, and that's that's an important, uh, I would say, uh, uh, discussion to be had uh, as well. I would say, um, you know, the uh, the Leo discussion that we, I just had with you is sort of coined uh, by a uh, bunch of scholars as what they call the look down space infrastructure, right? Like we said, GPS, uh, the imagery that you see from companies like Planet. Dot com, the uh, rapid and worldwide communication systems that you see, these are all sort of part of that look, look down uh, ecosystem. Uh, they don't even, this doesn't even account the national security applications, right, that we see. This is just the uses that you and I have based on our Google images and, and map and so forth. Um, uh, and of course, these also provide weather, uh, um, commercial aviation, maritime traffic, you know, wildlife traffic, uh, air traffic, Earth sciences, right? You know, when you get on a plane and it shows you that little map of when your plane's going to land, that's an important discussion, right? Like you, you, you're always eager and you want that needle to move faster. Uh, the weather, right? You, you don't have to worry about it. You just ask Alexa, but, you know, Alexa is tapping into somewhere else to get that information for you. Uh, wildlife tracking, right? Where's the wildlife going? Um, human migration, right? That's an important thing. Uh, the Uyghur situation in China was discovered r really by uh, satellite uh, imagery, by movements, by building up of these uh, uh, encampments uh, where uh, the Uyghurs were being uh, brought together and exterminated. That's, 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 these companies are the ones that uh, uncovered that uh, travesty for us. 
And of course, climate research, right? To know whether the sea level is rising, not rising, predicting um, you know, where the next drought's gonna happen. And so today, right now, the Department of Defense is very, very uh, focused on look down operations. And if you look at something called the Space Force Capstone, I would encourage you to read it. It's a very progressive document that just got released by Space Force. Um, and it looks at uh, making sure that everything that needs to function for the warfighter, right? Not just uh, Space Force folks, but everybody, the Navy, Army, Marine Corps, um, and Air Force, that they are able to execute uh, today's wars and tomorrow's wars, right? And that, that facilitates those operations, right? That those assets facilitate it. Well, that has a part that kind of has a seed for the future, right? What we consider sort of the uh, look up, right? Or what you have also potentially read as blue water space doctrine, where the brown water is the littoral, it's closer, and that is blue. Uh, it, this has started to become uh, a, a discussion point as well. And uh, last week or so, Air Force Research Lab uh, released a primer on cislunar, right? Uh, and, uh, and so it talks about the, what is required to do cislunar operations and, and what those operations mean. And uh, uh, the authors of that document are right, uh, you know, that there, we need to start planning. Um, but some people in the government are still saying, hey, we need, we, we're not there yet. Let's, you know, they're a little bit stubborn. Uh, and they're saying, hey, let's make sure that the mission we have at hand, uh, you know, is executed. Uh, we'll worry sort of about that when the time comes. Uh, but I think the time is here uh, because the Chinese are planning and they have some great proof of concepts and they've showcased some of their talent. Uh, and if we wait until the time is right, uh, the Chinese might be the ones telling us what the rules of uh, behaving in cislunar and on the lunar surface would mean. Uh, so in conclusion, I would say our, uh, you know, 21st century sort of defense and, and military uh, will require both capabilities, right? What we call blue water uh, or the look up and brown water, which is the look down capabilities and competencies, right? Uh, but it now is the time to build them both of them, one, because it's a, the, the, the brown water is a reality of every day that we have to fight through to get to the blue water. And then two is the one, as the blue water one, is because we are being outpaced by uh, other regimes who consider us adversaries. And, uh, you know, do we want them to be dictating the rules of the road for that? Uh, and so this also means that we need to be more flexible in the way we have our acquisition authorities. Uh, it, it is completely uh, irresponsible for us to have uh, acquire assets that take anywhere between five to 15 years to produce, uh, because by the time those things come off the production line, they might be uh, uh, obsolete. And especially if it's a military or intelligence product, it might be, uh, you know, it might be already eclipsed. So what use is that if I put that up against an adversary's uh, equipment, right? Uh, we need to have gap analysis. We need to have uh, uh, operational authorities looked at. What, what, what are the lanes of the road? How do we reorganize? And so we need to look at the full spectrum of uh, brown water, blue water, the look down and look out of uh, national security space uh, operations, but also uh, in alignment with the civil space and the commercial industry. Uh, so with that, I hope I have not rambled too much. Uh, I want to leave some time for us to have some discussion and questions. All right. So we will take questions now. So if you have questions for Dr. Sadat, please feel welcome to comment in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're watching on Facebook, to comment your questions in the Facebook comments section. Um, so the First question that we have, um, for those of us working on a master's at IWP, what would be a good next step to get into space-related national security policy and intelligence fields? Yeah, that's a really good question. So a couple of things. Uh, you have a couple of different options depending on uh, um, your preference. So one of the things you can do is you can join the US Space Force. You can become, uh, you're a college graduate. Uh, uh, if you have a bachelor's degree, you can you come in as an officer. If you have a graduate degree, you probably have a better chance of coming in, uh, but you can join the Space Force as a uh, lieutenant and you can work your way up. And I think there are even 
allowing for certain uh, waivers. So you can come in as a higher level. So if you have like a law degree or an engineering background, something like that, there's a higher chance to get in that way. So that is probably uh, the, the coolest way to get in. You'd be a Space Force Guardian. Um, I would recommend, you know, the other things to consider are there, if you're in VC, which you most of you are, there are at least two dozen think tanks and association non-for-profits, volunteer, uh, get involved, uh, even if it's, you know, uh, running um, an event or something like that, you will meet the most humble and sometimes maybe not so humble people in the space world. Uh, I would say one of the people that I have tremendous respect for is Dr. Scott Pace. He's a professor now at uh, George Washington University, but he was the executive secretary for the Space Council. Um, I would say one of the most approachable person I have ever met. Uh, and uh, these people will provide you mentoring. They will provide you guidance. So that would be the second thing to do would be get involved with uh, one of these associations. There are associations uh, like Space Force Journal is associated with Space Force As Association. There's National Security Space Association. There is the Satellite uh, Industry Association. I mean, you look at it, there's a bunch of them and you can get involved in them and you can go to these events, get to know these people, get to know the speakers. Um, a lot of them have, um, they derive amazing uh, 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 benefits from interacting with the questions you ask because those are the cutting edge questions that will help them prepare for the next event. So I would say do that piece as well. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, um, you know, read up on all of this literature. There, are, If you look at the uh, Space Force capstone, there's an index, there's about 10 or so authors in that field. Uh, when it comes to space strategy, there are, you know, probably four or five people that you have to read. You have to read uh, Dr. Klein, who's at George Washington University. You have to read Dr. Brent Zerniak, who's at Air Command Staff College. You have to read uh, Pete Gerritsen uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bradley Townsend. And of course, Joshua Carlson. These are the four or five theoreticians uh, slash strategists that you need to get uh, to know. Uh, and then just follow them. And I would say that would be my best get best for you to get to know them. Um, the other one would be to actually um, see if any of these companies that are coming up, uh, they uh, will hire you, uh, probably not pay you very well, but you have stock benefits. And uh, I would say hook up with one of these companies uh, when you see something and, and get to know them as much as you can. So I think there's a lot of options for you to do that. It wasn't like this when I was coming through the ranks. Uh, uh, there was nothing like this available for me. So I think you have a lot more uh, talent uh, that you can draw on. Great. Um, so we'll give it a few seconds more for any questions to come in um, from our attendees. I guess I have a question for you. In your opinion, who would you say is winning the space race? Who do you think is ahead in, the, in that arena? So, you know, that's hard to kind of judge. I would say we still are very innovative, right? Um, and the reason why we are good at uh, th the innovation piece is because we really do protect our um, intellectual property uh, and, and all of that. And so some of that we give away uh, pretty easily. Um, but we are starting to lose that comp competitive edge or that comparative advantage to China. Uh, and they basically take what we have and they make it better. They just simply make it better and we should just buy it back from them, right? Because they just make it better for us to use. Um, so we, we are kind of losing that angle uh, a little bit. The piece that also hurts us a little bit is that uh, there is no true ecosystem. What I mean by that, we don't know who's doing what in the U.S. Uh, there is no true ecosystem of who's doing what, how we can, if you are a company that is looking at the topography of the moon, and then there's another company that's looking at satellite imagery. Uh, you would not necessarily find each other, right? There's no, there's no place for you to go to say, hey, I'm looking for a company that does this because I have a specialty in X, Y, Z, or I'm looking for caves or mines or something like that. There is no ecosystem there. Whereas in China, everything is pretty much cataloged, right? They have a lot of other companies that are all over the place, but they kind of have a very good understanding of what's going on. So industry-wise, we're kind of uh, not organized as we could be. Militarily, I would say we still hold the edge in space. I don't think any nation would wanna uh, really mess with us in space. 
but that technology gap is starting to fall, I would say, and that, that is worrisome for uh, some of us that, that are in the, in the field. Great, thank you. Um, give it a minute here to let any questions come in from attendees. You gotta have some questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to speak too long. I can go for hours, but I, I, I cut this short just because I wanted to uh, see what questions are out there. Is there a, I guess I have another question. Is there a country that's maybe coming up through the ranks as a, in regards to its space um, capabilities and maybe that you could talk on that? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So. Um, you know, that, that's the other uh, thing to think about. You don't have to necessarily work in the U.S., right? You don't have to be in the U.S. space industry. It would be great, but you can be in Canada's space industry or one of the European nations. Um, so I would say uh, the next big power would be India. And here's the problem with uh, that for us is right now their, um, their uh, uh, commercial industries are pretty regulated, right? The minute they deregulate that, we're going to really feel that because it's going to put a lot more people on the road, right, on the, on the highway, uh, and it's going to make uh, potential uh, hazards. It will increase that. But at the same time, it will give our companies that are out there uh, co competitors. And the Indians are very good at space. You know, they, uh, the only thing that I would recommend is, you know, they uh, protect some of their intellectual property better. But they are very good in space and there is no, uh, I would say, limit to what they could achieve. And so that's an important discussion that I think that for U.S. policymakers, so if any of you are sort of writing papers or thesis, it would be to recommend that the U.S. government um, form a sort of a very strong bilateral relationship with India, not just because of the Pacific Ocean, not just because our Pacific Command was renamed to indo PACOM but because in space they are uh, reliable partners and they're very competent and we just need to evolve them a little bit. That's all. Um, I think that that is a very good question. I would say in Europe, you know, you have your traditional sort of Germany, France, the UK, um, Luxembourg is a uh, up, upcoming player in that world. Um, Italy is starting to you know, make some headway. There's some worries that Italy may um, cooperate more with China uh, and so that that would mean certain things that we wouldn't be able to do certain things with them if they did that. Thank you. Um, and we do have a question here. Um, how are space companies lobbying the government and to what ends? That's a really good question. So space companies, uh, when, you know, when we were at the White House, they would come to us as well and uh, to the Space Council. And the uh, Space Council would invite us from the uh, National Security Council to come sit in on those meetings. So we, we never took those meetings. Um, but they would come in and say, hey, certain regulations are, uh, that are on the books or certain policies that are on the books are hurting us. Can the White House help us? So if it was um, a White House uh, presidential executive order, which, you know, EO, you've heard of them, uh, then that's something we can fix. Or if it's a national security uh, related sort of presidential memorandum, that's something that we can easily fix. It'll still take time, nine months to a year to go through the entire coordination in the government. But for example, uh, remote sensing, right? These companies came to us and said, hey, uh, there's some restrictions on us. Uh, and if we don't participate in this, um, then other nations will uh, become the dominant. And uh, those nations are not necessarily friendly to the U.S., or our allies. And so they will sell uh, imagery and information of where our potentially troops and other uh, sources could be in the world. Uh, but, you know, we are red blooded Americans. We will help American, uh, the American government and, and make sure we are sort of unified. And so when we looked at that at first, you know, I'm an intelligence officer. I said, no, no, we, you, that's not good. You shouldn't be doing that. And then later on, I said, you know what? You should be taking over the global market because you and our allies should, because you understand uh, what our concerns are, right? And we don't want to cede that to a nation that is rogue, that just will sell everything. And so from that standpoint, for example, companies come and lobby. And so that, that is a successful lobby. 
um, that they come to the uh, to the White House and they ask for certain things for consideration. Of course, most of that does involve interagency coordination and so forth. Um, and then, of course, to uh, the Hill, which I've never worked on the Hill, uh, there's restrictions, of course, but they will go to the Hill and they will uh, propose uh, even legislation uh, to the Hill. And there's right now, I think, over a dozen or so different types of space legislation and acts before uh, um, the House and the Senate that you can look and Google through. Um, and it's written because some company somewhere or a consortium or a group of people have approached a senator and that senator's district will or a senator's state will benefit. And so that is some, um, some of that lobbying that goes on. But yeah, lobbying is going on everywhere. Just have to make sure you're registered. <laughs> All right, another question here. What are the key international legal instruments underlying space exploration and exploitation right now? And what instruments are forthcoming? Yeah, so I mean, the Outer, Outer Space Treaty uh, is still, in, in, you know, has, it still has not been replaced. So that is important. Uh, and, you know, that there are some concerns um, and rightful concerns of the U.S. as well, right? Um, you can do, uh, you can set up a base, for example, on the moon, but the leadership of that base cannot be military. You can have military people there if they're in scientific roles, right? Just like we had in exploration to Antarctica, we had military, Coast Guard, and others uh, that all participated. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, the intent of the mission needs to be scientific. So you have scientists in charge of the mission, uh, you know, um, the idea of what is weaponization of space, right? That's an important discussion that needs to happen. Uh, and so, you know, what, what is a weapon? Is a weapon the actual projectile, having a projectile in space that shoots another space asset or, a, uh, or shoots down to earth? Or could cyber be considered a weapon, right? Or could lasing and jamming be considered a weapon? Uh, those are all sort of still happening uh, to our systems. Uh, you can read the Defense uh, Intelligence Agency unclassified report on the internet from 2019, and they have another one coming out uh, this year about all of those sort of um, militarization of space that other nations have done to us. And so, of course, you know, we, we will respond in kind, ne necessarily haven't done that. Uh, but those are things there. Um, as far as exploitation of what is happening on the moon and otherwise, there are, there's still a discussion. There's an executive order that I would refer everybody to look at from the Trump administration on how that administration viewed, and it's still valid because that executive order has not been pulled back or superseded by anything about um, space, uh, or, you know, not being a global commons, that there could be private uh, property rights uh, in space. And what would that mean? Does that mean you... Uh, uh, own a certain um, location in space? Does that mean you own and or own a certain plot of, of the lunar surface or an asteroid? Uh, what does that all mean? If you jump on an asteroid first, can you say that's my asteroid and nobody else can touch it? Uh, and then what happens if someone else jumps on it? Do you sue them? Right now in space, the, if someone violates a law, you really only can sue them for money, right? You can't sue them to take them to jail kind of thing or other, uh, you, know, you can't court martial somebody, that kind of stuff. So those are uh, discussions that will be, uh, I think, had soon. And, uh, and our nation's um, involvement in that is gonna be dictated upon where we are in our role. Are we still gonna be in the brown water phase? Or are we in the blue water phase of, uh, of our uh, mission in space? <clears throat> Another question um, that we have here is one of the reasons for establishing a separate space force was to consolidate the variety of agencies with a role in U.S. military space ops. To date, the space force has not been integrated with any of the 60 plus various such agencies. When will this happen, if ever? What are your views of incorporating the NRO as part of the space force? Uh, this person is uh, must be an intel officer. Okay, so here's here's what's going on with the space force, right? Um, and so you have Navy uh, transferring their space satellites, um, and then uh, Army will do that as well. And there there's going to be some lateral transfers that sailors and soldiers can join the space force. Of course, um, there's 
billets, right? How many can you take in a certain year and so forth? The Space Force is currently at 6,000 and uh, approximate 2,000 of their reservists are still in the Air Force. Their fate hasn't been decided yet. Uh, so that needs to happen. Uh, and the question is, uh, does the Navy, for example, give up all of its space talent, right? Does, do, do I have to leave uh, the, the Navy as well and join the uh, Space Force Reserves? Do I have to join them or not? Uh, the problem here is, is that the Navy, the Army, all of the services have to present tr uh, um, forces to what they call combatant commands. And so Space, for space Command is a combatant command. So it's, it can't just all be Space Force people there. It has to be Navy as well and other forces. So some of the other services have to retain some of their talent uh, and some of their competencies while they give away their capabilities, which is their uh, overhead capabilities. Um, now, as far as uh, NRO, there's also a discussion about Missile Defense Agency, right? Like, why is Missile Defense Agency also not part of the Space Force? And there's a, a, a theoretical debate there in that uh, if you talk to the space people, they say, well, missiles is a, um, a compliance sort of uh, regime and space is an innovation regime. So the, one is risk averse, which is the missile, and space is risk tolerant. The two cultures don't jive. So MDA shouldn't be part of it. NRO is a very good point that you bring up in that NRO is a capability of space, right? It's space power. They have the capability to launch. And why isn't it part of Space Force? It potentially should be part of Space Force, but when? Right now, Space Force hasn't, I would say, matured enough to be able to absorb that role, but I would say eventually it should, right? And then um, all of the non-DOD uh, capabilities are really not within the threshold of Space Force. You know, that, that would then mean that Parts of NASA would be militarized. Parts of NOAA uh, would be militarized. And so we, we don't want that yet. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, uh, General Deptula uh, asks, what about NGA? Exactly. So NGA would be the same thing, uh, General Deptula. I would say, uh, you know, NRO should be, in theory, part of um, uh, 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 space Force, because, sir, as you know, it's it's part of space power, right? It should be. The question is, can sp can the Space Force uh, um, uh, operate and function with an extra layer of uh, on their plate, right? Right now, are, can they do they have enough on their plate right now? Yes or no? Um, NGA, I would say it's a little bit different because really they are doing exploitation. Uh, they're doing intelligence uh, exploitation. They're buying the stuff. Uh, so unless uh, the intelligence, um, the Space Force as the newest member of the intelligence community uh, becomes uh, more robust uh, and, and, and assumes more of an intelligence function, uh, I think NGA potentially should stay out. I would like to thank Dr. Sadat for joining us and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and Facebook. If you're interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Again, that's iwp.edu. Thank you, everyone.